Hello, my name is Portier Stringer, and I'm a computer science instructor at Code for Fun. Today, we'll be building a counter app. As you can see, it can count up, it can count down. When I press the reset button, the count will be cleared. Today, I'm also going to introduce you to a platform we use for a beginner's mobile app development course called MIT App Inventor. MIT App Inventor is a platform that allows programmers of all ages and skill levels to get started quickly with mobile app development. It uses a block-based language to control the behavior of Android phones and tablets. If you've used Scratch before, then parts of this interface will be familiar. In order to follow along with this tutorial, I'm assuming that you have at least some familiarity with Scratch or another programming language. Specifically, you need to know addition, subtraction, and what a variable is in the context of programming. The apps you create with MIT App Inventor can be used on physical Android devices. If you do not have a physical Android device, I will provide links to help you get set up using an Android emulator like the one I'm using in this tutorial. Without further ado, let's get started. To begin, you'll want to open up your browser, preferably Google Chrome, and you're going to want to navigate to appinventor.mit.edu. You can see that in my address bar at the top. When you get there, you should see an orange button toward the top of the screen, either in the corner or if your window is smaller like mine, I can enlarge it so it looks more like yours. You're gonna to wanna to click on this button, it says create, apps. Once you click on the create apps button, you're going to be prompted to log in to MIT App Inventor or create an account if you do not already have an account. You may be brought to either this screen or if it's your first time using it, you may be brought directly to the project screen. When you arrive at the project screen, you may see a box like this appear. If you do, you can just press continue to get rid of the box. If you've used MIT App Inventor before, you may see the work of a previous project here. If that's the case, you can navigate to the projects button in the top navigation bar, click on it, and then click start new project to open a new project. When you click start new project, you will be prompted to name your project. I'll call mine counter app. You should call your project something that you can remember and come to later. There are two main interfaces in MIT App Inventor, the designer interface and the blocks interface. We can switch between the two using this button in the upper right hand corner. We can switch between blocks and designer interface. The designer interface is where we go to specify how our application should look, while the blocks interface is where we go to define the behavior of our application. The preview screen in the middle starts blank, but we can drag components to the screen to build our user interface. Components are at the core of MIT App Inventor, and we can find them all in the left palette section. We have many components that we can use for our applications in the palette section. Some components can be seen and interacted with, while others, such as the sensor components, just control behind the scenes functionality while the user does not see or interact with them directly at all. For this tutorial, we will deal with only two types of components, the user interface components and the layout components both of which the user will interact with directly. I took a picture of the final app to use as a guide for what this project should look like. As you can see, we have three buttons and we also need to display a number. Just by looking at the buttons, you can tell that we're going to need to use three button components. Take a moment and drag out three button components. Don't worry about their placement for now.
According to our mock, we're also going to need a place to display a number. For that, we're going to use a label component. Drag a label component above the three button components that you added. Whenever you add a new component to the screen, it's good practice and extremely useful to rename that component such that you would be able to tell what it was even if you could not see this preview screen. That's because when you begin programming, you will not be able to see this preview screen as you control the behavior of these components. To rename a component, look in the Components tab to the right of your preview screen. Identify the component you want to rename and make sure it's highlighted green. Label 1 is highlighted green, so that's the one I'm going to rename. At the bottom of the components, at the bottom of the components pane, you'll find the rename button. Click on the rename button to rename your component. I'm going to name it something that would tell me what it is, even if I'm not looking directly at it. I'll call it label count since this label will be used to display the current count. Next, we need to rename our up, down, and reset buttons. Take a moment and rename your up, down, and reset buttons. Notice how renaming components does not change their appearance on the screen. Even though you've named this label count and you've named your buttons up, down, and reset, the text on those components is still the same. To change the appearance of a component, we need to look at the Properties tab. Let's start with the label component. After making sure that the component you want to edit is highlighted, take a look at the Properties. Each of these controls a different setting regarding your component. The property that controls the text on the component is the text property. You can find it here. I'm going to change the text on my component to zero since the count is going to start at zero when the app starts. Once you edit that property, press enter and you'll see it will change on the screen. Take a moment, pause the video, and change the text for each of your buttons. Good job on renaming your buttons. You'll notice that if you try to drag components around on your screen, it's very difficult to move them anywhere. I can't position these buttons just by dragging them. We actually need to use another set of components to control where buttons appear. Let's say I want my up and down buttons to be side by side, just like my guide here. To do that, we need to find a layout component. If you click on the layout category, we want to grab the horizontal arrangement. The horizontal arrangement is a component that you can put other components inside of. Any components inside of the horizontal arrangement component will be rendered horizontally next to each other instead of vertically above each other. I'm going to drag my up button and my down button inside the horizontal arrangement. Now, they're side by side. Take a moment and drag your buttons into the horizontal arrangement component. Once you've finished arranging your buttons side by side, another difference you may notice between our project and our guide is the fact that our buttons are very small and confined to one part of the screen. There are two things we want to do to fix this. The first thing we want to do is center our buttons. The second thing we want to do is make sure that they stretch across the screen. Let's begin by centering our buttons. To center our buttons, we want to edit the properties of our screen component. If you look in the component section, the entire screen is represented by a single component and we can control the alignment of other components within our screen 
by changing one of the align properties. The align horizontal property is currently set to left. That means anything on our screen is going to be aligned to the left side of our screen. If we want to center those components, we can align it to center. Another thing you might choose to do is instead of aligning the, the components to the top of the screen, we could also align those to the center of the screen or the bottom, depending on your intentions for your interface. Now that our components are centered, we want to make them fill the screen, just like in our guide. To do that, we're going to have to go through a few steps, but they all rely on one property. Let's start with the horizontal arrangement component. Make sure it's selected by clicking on it in the components tab. You could also click on it in the phone preview. It might be a little bit more difficult since there's other components in the way there. Under the horizontal arrangement properties, you want to identify the one that says width. By default, it's set to automatic. However, we can make it fill up the screen by having it fill its parent. By parent, we mean the component that immediately contains the horizontal arrangement, in this case, the screen. Notice how the horizontal arrangement component stretches across the screen, but our buttons go to the left again. That's because the horizontal alignment property for our for our horizontal arrangement component is currently set to left. Just like with our screen component, we need to change that alignment to center. Now that we've centered our buttons, we want them both to fill up the remainder of the horizontal arrangement component. To do that, we want to highlight each of our buttons. I will start with the up button. I'm going to set the width to fill parent. This will take up all the extra space in our horizontal arrangement component. Notice how it's very lopsided right now. If we do the same for our down button, then it will even out. So now we have a layout that's a little bit more similar to our own. I want you to pause the video and see if you can figure out how to use the properties of each component to make this screen look just like our guide. Also, feel free to experiment and make it look a little bit different if you get the hang of this. All right, if you've unpaused the video, I assume you're ready for the next steps. For those of you that are waiting for me to tell you how to do the previous steps, I'm going to quickly go through the property changes that we need to get our screen looking more like our guide. First, I'm going to go ahead and bold the text on each of the buttons and the label. So start with the label. I'm going to set this checkbox font bold. Make sure it's checked. You'll see the label will change. I'm going to do that for each of my buttons as well. Next, I want to make these buttons a little bit bigger. To do that, I'm going to change the height of my up and down buttons to 100 pixels. Remember, pixels, if you don't know, are just those tiny dots of color on your screen that make up all the images you see. They're very tiny, so you can't see them. And 100 of them you're, is about that big, up and down. I'm going to do the same thing for my down button. See, and here's what I did wrong here. The percentage is different from the pixels. So the percentage is 100% of whatever your parent is. So the parent is the horizontal arrangement component. Right now it's this big. Right, so now those buttons are looking better. I just want my reset to stretch across the screen. We can do that the same way we did it with our previous buttons and our horizontal arrangement component. 
Simply find the width property, set it to fill parent. If you like, you can color the buttons to make them stand out more. I chose to make my up button green, I chose to make my down button red. I'll leave it up to you, the colors that make the most sense to you. Next, I'm going to enlarge the font of my label because it's really tiny. I don't really like it. Instead of 14, I'll try 40. I'm also going to try and make some space here by changing the height of my label. Let's try 100. I think that works. Let's compare it to our guide. Looks just about the same. All right. So now that we have our user interface, we're ready to move on to the exciting part. Running it and getting it to work. <laughs> If you have an Android device, you may choose to run this app on that. To do that, you're going to need an application to connect to MIT App Inventor. That application is MIT AI2 Companion. Go ahead and install it on your Android device now if you haven't already. If you don't have an Android device, then you need to use an emulator. MIT App Inventor provides an emulator on their website that can be used for this purpose. It can be installed on Mac, Windows, or Linux if we have any Linux users. And the instructions to install it and run it are all on their website. Before continuing, make sure to either download the emulator or get the MIT App Companion on your Android device. That way you'll be able to test going forward. The connection options for running your app can be found at the top navigation menu under the button connect. If you're going to be using your Android physical device, such as a phone or a tablet, you're going to click on the button that says AI Companion. From your app, you'll find a screen that gives you the option of either scanning a QR code to connect to your app or entering the six digit code that you see here. Choose any one of those options to connect to your application. I'm going to connect from my own personal phone so that you can see what the computer screen will look like when it's connecting. I'm choosing to scan the QR code. I've just scanned the code with my phone. And you can see that now we have a progress bar on the desktop. Depending on the speed of your internet connection, it may take up to a couple minutes for your app to load. But mine just loaded right now. Although you can't see it, I have a similar interface to what we designed here. And I'm able to touch these buttons and I see that they're being pressed because the appearance changes slightly. However, nothing beyond that is happening on your phone screen. That's because we haven't programmed the behavior of our application yet. But now that we know how to get it running, we're not far from that. It's time to head over to the blocks interface. To enter the blocks interface and begin programming, navigate toward the upper right hand corner of your screen and you'll find a button that says blocks. Click on the blocks button to open up the blocks interface. If you've programmed in Scratch before, this interface will look somewhat familiar to you. In the middle, we have a workspace. This is where we're going to drag blocks together, telling our app what it needs to do. You're going to find those instructions over on the left in the block section. Just like in Scratch, we have several similar categories. We have a control category. We use these blocks to tell what order, how many times, and under what conditions things should happen. A logic category. It's very useful in conjunction with the control category. We're going to use a couple blocks from the math category today. Nothing too intense, just some addition and subtraction. We're also going to use blocks from the variables category today. But some very important blocks. Um, 
we have something like them in Scratch, but here it gets a little bit more sophisticated. Each of these components here that you added in the designer interface, you can see them showing up here. And now you can kind of see why I had you rename them because we don't want to have to look back at our designer interface every time we want to tell what component is what. If you click on one of these components, you'll see that we have several blocks associated with them. These blocks do a few things. The yellow blocks are events. If you remember events from scratch, anything attached to an event block will happen whenever that event occurs. So when we click the up button, anything attached to this block is going to happen. Since we're going to be interacting with each of our buttons, we're going to need these click events. I'm going to start by dragging out the button up click event. We'll focus on one for now, and you'll have the opportunity to add more later. It's time to ask ourselves, what do we want to happen when the up button is clicked? Well, if you think back to our demo, we want the count to increase, but we need a way to keep track of that count. We know it starts at zero, and we want to show it on our label, but we're going to need to use another block in order to... We know it starts at zero, and we show it on our label, but we're going to need to use a variable to keep track of and manipulate the count using our buttons. To create a variable, we're going to go to the variables category. I want you to drag the block out that says initialize global name to. Name is going to be the name of your variable. If you click on it, you can change it to whatever you like. In this case, I'm going to call it count because we're using it to keep track of the count. We know that we want the count to begin at zero, so I'm going to go to math and I'm going to find this number block. By default, it's zero. I can just drag it out and attach it to the count. There are two main blocks associated with every variable in MIT App Inventor. We have, if you hover over the name of your variable, you'll see that two blocks show up. We have a get block and a set block. Set blocks are used to change the value of the variable while get blocks are used to read and use the value of the variable somewhere. Right now, the current value of count is zero, but we want it to go up whenever the up button is pressed. Since we use set blocks to change the count, I'm going to drag a set block into my button up click event. Whenever the up button is clicked, we want to change our count to be one more than it was previously. To do that, we're going to need to do some arithmetic. I'm going to get this plus operator, and I'm going to attach it to my set global count block. You'll notice there's two empty spaces for us to fill here. First, we're going to use a get block because we want to read the current value of count. And then, if we want count to be one more than what it was before, we can just add one to it. I'll go ahead and duplicate this number block by right clicking and pressing duplicate. And then I'm going to change the number to one. So now every time the up button is clicked, we're going to change our count to be one more than it was before. But that's not enough. We still need to show the user that variable. Right now, we are not. If you remember, we use the label count to display the current count. You'll notice that label doesn't have any event blocks associated with it. However, it does have a lot of set blocks. And if you didn't know, these light green ones are get blocks. Since we want to change the text, not just read it, we're going to find the set block that allows us to access the text of our label. So I'm going to look for label count dot text, and I'm getting the set block. Whenever the up button is clicked, 
we want to change the label's text to reflect the new count. To do that, we're going to use a get block. Here, we're setting our label to the count. Once you have this set of blocks arranged, you can go ahead and test it using your emulator or your Android device. Go ahead and pause the video to test and make sure this is working before continuing. All right. So testing that previous functionality, if you press the up button, you should notice that the number changes, it gets bigger. However, if you press any other button, nothing should happen yet. Now that we know how click event works, we can do something very similar for our down button. If this is working, pause the video and see if you can do the same thing for the down button. There is one adjustment you may have to make. Were you able to get this application working for the down button? If not, I'll demonstrate how to do that now. Because we're doing something very similar, I'll start by duplicating this entire stack. Instead of redoing everything from scratch, we can use what we've already built. I'll duplicate the entire stack, and I'm going to change button up to button down. Notice how when both of them are button up, there's an X on both of these blocks. That's because it's not good to have two different event, two of the same events doing different things. So MIT App Inventor will show you an error with this X if that's the case. I'm going to change this to down to get rid of that error. And the only thing different that we want to do is instead of incrementing the count, we want to decrement the count, making it smaller. To do that, instead of adding one, we'll subtract one. So I'm going to drag out this plus operator, and I'm going to drag this into the trash can. Under math, I'm going to find the subtraction operator. And I'm going to place my get global count, my one back there. Take a moment to test this out. Make sure it works before continuing. For the reset button, we can duplicate the code from one of our other buttons. To duplicate the code, right click or use two buttons, on, use two fingers on the trackpad. Once you've duplicated the code, there's a few things we need to change. First is the button that work is the button that we're programming. I'll change this to button reset or reset button. Next, we know that we don't want to decrement the number when we click the reset button. We just want to set the count to zero. So I'll get rid of the second part here, throw it in the trash. Next, I'll take one of my number blocks and duplicate it. I'll attach the number block, and since we want the count to be set to zero, I'll change the one to a zero. Take a moment, pause the video, and test that to make sure it works. After coding the reset button, you should see that pressing the up button causes the count to increment, while pressing the down button causes it to decrement, and pressing the reset button should set the count to zero. If you have this working, then this concludes the tutorial. Thank you for coding with me.